past times at Bridgemont High. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have pizza about that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon about reading and writing. So details. And I like this talk because a lot of this research has helped me as a writer, as a thinker. So I hope this will be good for your students and will be good for you. We're going to begin by talking about free voluntary reading. There's a lot of different words and they all pretty much mean the same thing. Free voluntary reading, self-selected reading, same thing you choose the book. In classes we call it sustained silent reading. You've heard of that? SSR. By the way, we used to call it USSR. Did you know that? <laughs> Uninterrupted, sustained, silent reading. We don't do that anymore. Then there's DEAR. You've heard of this? D-E-A-R. Drop everything and read. Alfie Cohn says they should have something called Drop Everything and Drill. D-E-A-D. -E Got it? OK, all right, go. So I want to give you some of the research on reading so you'll have an idea that this is not just a crazy idea. And there's several kinds of research. One kind of research are sustained silent reading programs. Here's how it works. Sustained silent reading, you take a few minutes out of the school day and the children read. The children read whatever they want to read. And the teacher reads whatever the teacher wants to be. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I have calculated, if you do sustained silent reading once a day with one class, 10 minutes, and you're reading while the students are reading, you're relaxing, enjoying yourself, over a normal teaching career, this amounts to three months paid vacation. <laughs> Do I have your attention? We have to find out if this works. Teaching is very difficult. 10 minute break every day? Yes, I think that's important. Anyway, let's look at the research. This is the first big sustained silent reading project that really made a big difference. This project was done by two very top, well-known researchers. Um, and it was done in the Fiji Islands. Uh, the researchers were Warwick Ellie, a retired full professor from New Zealand, and, uh, and one of his colleagues from the Fiji Islands. That Warwick Ellie, I have to tell you this, I have to give you the gossip, okay? You like gossip? Who was it who said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, sit next to me. <laughs> Actually, that was uh, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt's daughter said that, Alice Roosevelt. Okay. No, it wasn't. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'll give you the gossip on this. Warwick Ellie is one of the most respected scholars in the field. And his colleague in this project, uh, Francis Marcouvai, also first class, uh, first class scholar with a wonderful reputation. They published this in a journal called the Reading Research Quarterly. The Reading Research Quarterly is the number one snob journal in reading. Most of the articles in this journal are completely incomprehensible. They're long, exhausting, they go on and on. You never know what you're talking about. When my copy of the journal arrives, I make extra coffee, sit down, start to read, and I try to stay awake so I can you know, read through these things and if there are any details. This is where this article came out. This is amazing, 1983. They looked at children in the Fiji Islands. The children had sustained silent reading every day for 30 minutes. In sustained silent reading, if they're given this time to read, no accountability, no testing, just enjoy yourselves, okay? They had 30 minutes a day of English, and in the grade four and five, they were divided into three groups. The middle group had sustained silent reading for 30 minutes. That was the entire English program. Free reading, nothing else. Now they already had English since kindergarten so they could understand the books. The first group on the left had the 
audio lingual method. This is traditional bad language teaching, and it's a combination of everything we know does not work. It's boring classroom exercises, repetition, error correction, testing, everything, making children speak before they're ready, everything that's wrong. The one on the right is called Big Books, and in Big Books, the teachers read to the children from Big Books so they can see the stories. They discuss the stories, and the children can read whatever they want to read. They can do self-selected reading. The numbers up there are very important. These numbers, I think, change the world. They're the number of months the children gain the first year of the project. We expect native speakers of English to gain 10 months in one year. That's the average. What happened here? Audiolingual. Fourth graders, 6.5 months gain. Fifth graders, pathetic, two and a half months. Really? The, look at sustained silent reading. 15 months gain. That is amazing. The fifth graders, nine months gain, a modest but good result. Big books, 15 months gain for groups. It wasn't even close. The readers did much better. The second year of the project, this nine disappeared, and the, the, all the reading groups were the same. And farther ahead of the audio lingual group. 1983, we have known about this since 1983, published in the most conservative journal in the field, where we have top researchers, excellent statistics, the best journals. This one should have changed everything, in my opinion. And it's not the only study. It's one of hundreds of studies that have come up, come up with the same conclusion. Well, we have uh, other data. I'd like to show you a correlational study. Uh, Spanish teachers here? Okay, Spanish teachers, let's talk about the subjunctive. Oh no. Uh, Chinese teachers, the subjunctive is the nightmare of Spanish language teaching. You try to teach it, you try to teach it, nobody learns it. It's complicated. It's subtle. Well, I was part of this experiment. They did a study in Utah. They looked at uh, people who had studied Spanish as a second language, and they uh, tested them on their ability to use the subjunctive in everyday language. It's okay, I'll tell you what's there. Sorry about the lights, okay? They tested them on their ability. Here are the predictors of high performance in the subjunctive. The number of years you study Spanish didn't matter. The number of years you studied the Spanish subjunctive didn't matter. The number of years you lived in the country where Spanish is spoken didn't matter. The amount of reading, yes. Strong, strong results. You get the subjunctive by reading for pleasure and doing a lot of it. I pretty good does. Questions? Good. Let's go on to the next study. This is good. Case studies. I love case studies. I love these stories of people who've done the learning. <laughs> the master of case studies today is my colleague, Benico Mason, uh, from Japan. I was with Benico last week. We were in France last week. And Benico came at a TPRS conference, just like this one. Benico came and did a presentation of storytelling that astonished everybody. Can I tell you gossip about me, Benico, and my wife? <laughs> Good story, okay? We were at a conference in Russia, a lot of love stalk Russian, and Benico was there, and my wife and I came to hear Benico give a talk. And she gave a storytelling talk. She's a very good artist, she draws pictures. She tells fairy tale stories from Grimm's fairy tales. Makes it very comprehensible. And she presented the research when it was over. Now, I've been married 49 years. Okay. All right. And we are, uh, I think we're the third longest married couple in California. <laughs> 
and it's, we're, we're, we get along very well, and my wife thinks I'm a wonderful speaker. She admires my ability to speak always. At the end of Benico's presentation, my wife turns to me and says, that was the best presentation I have ever heard. <laughs> and I said, including mine? She said, yes. <laughs> That's Benico Mason, let me tell you. So this is a, a study she's been doing. Benico is a professor in, a, in Osaka, and one of the things she does is she teaches a class in English as a foreign language for adults. She gets all kinds of people in the class, ranging from some of the people in their 20s, uh, the oldest student was 76. The class was all storytelling, and homework is reading great readers of stories in English. Well, when the class was over at the end of the year, some of the students wanted to continue with her, and they said, could you help us on the reading program? And she said, sure. And she helped them find books to read, and she said, I'll help you with this, and we can talk about the reading occasionally if you do need something for me. She said, I would like you to take versions of the TOEIC test, pre-test and post-test. One when you begin, one after a year or two. The TOEIC test, T-O-E-I-C, is really well known in Asia. Some of you have heard about it. It's very popular in Japan and in Taiwan. In fact, uh, companies require you to have a certain TOEIC score, an English score, like a TOEFL, before they'll hire you. There's one guy in Japan who really has no life. This guy is really crazy. He keeps taking the TOEIC test again and again, and he keeps getting 100, and he gets his name in the newspaper. <laughs> this is a sad case. I think this guy needs therapy. <laughs> so anyway, TOEIC is really a big deal. The TOEIC is on a scale of zero to 1,000. If your score is around 200, 250, <clears throat> this is like advanced beginner, low intermediate. Nearly enough to do some reading on your own, etc. You get up to the 900s, you're really good. That's considered academic English. Well, they asked people to take the TOEIC, and I, I worked with Benico on this. We calculated how much time they put in reading. Here are results, seven subjects, and it was very consistent. For every hour you read, you gain about one half point on the TOEIC, 0.6 points. Let's think of what that means. This means if you read one hour a day over three years, you can go from 200, 250, all the way to the top. Now think about this. This is not an hour a day of torture. This is an hour a day of relaxing and having a good time. They put in this time in TOEIC preparation classes. They go three, four hours a day, study, study, study. This is much more efficient and much more effective and much more pleasure. And it works. And all the students read different things. Some of them read rated readers. One man, I like this guy, he read romances. You know, designed for women, love stories. Uh, it's a pretty self-confident guy. He actually liked them, all that stuff. So it was all different, and, they, and the 76-year-old made the same, made the same progress as everybody else. So this is quite a stunning study. Uh, let's go on to more case histories. Again, I'm giving you just bits and pieces, and they all come to the same conclusion. A woman named Elizabeth Murray. Elizabeth Murray is now reasonably famous. Uh, she grew up in heavy, heavy poverty. She wrote her life story, and a TV movie, a book about her that she wrote. Um, and she eventually did well in school and went on to Harvard and graduated, even though she grew up in deep, deep poverty in New York. Well, her dad was her savior. Her dad saved her career. Dad had an interesting habit. In those days, when Elizabeth Murray was growing up, the New York public library system, each small branch was independent. They weren't connected to the other libraries. They didn't have fancy computer systems we do today. So dad would go to a local library, get a library card, take out as many books as he could, and never return them. 
So the house was filled with fugitive library books from all over the city. Elizabeth read the books. She went to school, elementary school, but not very much. She really only went to school just before the examination to find out what was on the exam. She said that thanks to all her reading, she managed to pass each grade and then did better and better at school, went on to college and did very well. Poverty, you can overcome the effects of poverty, at least some of them, with access to books in some form. So again, similar results. Well, I've given you a quick look at the research. I want to be practical for a moment. It's very difficult for me to be practical because I'm a retired college professor and we don't enjoy being practical. We think this is beneath our dignity. If it's useful, we're not interested in general. But if it's not useful and incomprehensible, then it's interesting to us. But I'll try to be practical. I've been, uh, actually, I had to do this. There were a lot of attacks on sustained silent reading. In the beginning, they said it didn't work. And then we found out it worked. We did research back and forth, discussions in the journals and all that. And yes, indeed, it does work, the uh, PGI one studies. But then they say, the kids in sustained silent reading classes aren't reading. They're pretending to read. One scholar said, it's really sustained silent page turning. Well, I looked at all the papers I could find uh, that claim kids aren't reading. It turns out they are. There are very few cases like this. And I have isolated uh, what some of the factors are uh, where kids really uh, aren't reading. Number one is sometimes teachers don't understand that it takes time to get involved in a book. If you look at the children the first week, they're not reading. They haven't found a book yet. Give them time to find a book, get interested. Ah, more gossip. What do men talk about in the bathroom? Tell me. I was giving one of these workshops once and uh, on reading, and I was in the men's room. You'll be happy to know I was washing my hands. And another man was there, who was at my seminar, and we started talking in the men's room. This is what men talk about. He said, I do sustained silent reading with my kids, but they don't do it. Nobody reads, they don't care. They just sit around and they turn pages. And I said, all of them? No, 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 not all of them. How many don't read? Well, there's this small group of three or four. Turns out there was one child who wouldn't read. When you look harder, these cases disappear. I said, this one child didn't read all year long? Oh, no, no, eventually he started to read. So you give it some time, you look at it in the middle of the year, give them a chance to you know, look at the books and browse. You and I go to the bookstore. We stay there for 40 minutes, a half an hour, two hours, isn't that right? We look at books, we browse, we take our time. We tell the children, go get your book, sit down, start to read. And we take all this time so give them a chance, give them a chance to get into it. If you look at it the first week, nothing's going to be happening. Number two, some people say, you should bring your own book to class. Well, that's okay, but sometimes kids don't have a chance to bring a book. They're running late to school or they forget. We should make sure we provide books, make sure we provide books that are interesting and comprehensible for kids to read. Okay, number three. Some people do uh, sustained silent reading one day a week for the whole period, like 40 minutes. No, I can't. If you force me to sit down and read for 40 minutes, I probably won't do it. I'll probably want to get up, do something else, uh, et cetera. What we think is better is a little bit each day, not all at once. People have asked me how much time should we do sustained silent reading? And I cannot give you an answer because it depends on the teacher, the class, the students, the books. What I can tell you from talking to your colleagues is this, do a little less than you think they can do. If you think the children can sit still for 15 minutes, do 10 minutes of sustained silent reading. If you think 10 minutes is enough, eight minutes. 
seven minutes. Here's what you want. Sometimes you have a reluctant reader who doesn't want to read. And he sits and does nothing. And then, after a few weeks, the teacher says, okay, put down your books. And that one reluctant reader says, wait, I want to finish this paragraph. Then you won. A little bit less than you think they can handle. Always a little less. Distributed, not masked. Not all at once, a little at a time. So this is the collected wisdom of your colleagues who uh, thought about this. Relax. Keep the classroom relaxed. Relax conditions. We don't want rigid. We want this. This is high in this class. They do reading and relax. Look at this guy. I like him. He's okay. <laughs> Okay, this is wonderful, slouched over. That's how we do it, that's real life. Sometimes the teacher says, clear your desk, nothing on your desk, only the book, and you must sit and read your book and no interruptions, etc." Unnatural, why do we make this so difficult? Our goal is a relaxed environment with lots of options so you can be comfortable, okay? Okay, no testing, no assessment. I know this bothers many people. Many people assume that all young people are evil and lazy. And if we don't watch them carefully, they're gonna do nothing. Not true. Give them a chance. Trust the reader a little bit. If they get involved in the book, they're gonna be fine. You will be, you'll know. You'll know by looking at them if they're involved in the book. The more we assess children in sustained silent reading, the less they are going to read. The less we assess them, the more they're going to read. How would it be if every time you read the newspaper, you had to write a book report? <laughs> or take a test? This is the quickest way to kill interest in reading for at least 10 minutes a day. Let them relax, read what they want. No fear of assessment. In fact, in one article I read about this, very interesting article, the teacher who did sustained silent reading, every so often would have a session just to talk about the books with the kids. What did you think, what did you think? The children interpreted this as a test and it made them very, very anxious. If you want to have a sign reading and discuss it, that's literature class. This is different, this is just reading for fun. So let's uh, take it a little bit easy. Okay. They need not finish, am I up to the first place? Yes, they need not finish every book that they start. Famous author Nancy Adwell recently said, if a reader does not finish a book, this is the mark of a good reader. This is the mark of someone highly literate. Highly literate people do not feel that they must finish every book that they start. Isn't that interesting? Just the opposite. Students should be praised when they give up on a book. I don't want this, I want something else. How do you feel when someone gives you a book as a present? 